begin by telling you my name is Gary Ocugrosso. I am the founder and managing partner of a company called Franchise Growth Solutions. Not only take startup concept, concepts and do the work necessary to create franchises, uh, but we also create selling strategies and then get involved with the franchisors in vetting, soliciting, vetting, and awarding franchisees or awarding franchises to potential franchisees. And when we are successful in scaling those companies up, those franchise companies up, sometimes the franchisors are looking for infusion, cash infusion to grow, or sometimes they're looking for exits. So that's what Franchise Growth Solutions does. And uh, there are typically three stages of growth in the capital needs uh, in, a, in, in the evolution, if you will, of a franchise company, or any company for that matter. Uh, startup, which is bringing the concept to reality. Typically, that startup capital comes from yourself or friends and family. Um, sometimes it comes from a venture capitalist, but that venture capitalist, again, is probably an extension of friends and family, and it's usually Great, right, they're writing a check. It's very detrimental to the guy that money that you would be looking for. Uh, there are typically three stages of growth where you want to fuel the expansion of the business. So if you're a franchisor and you have 8, 10, 12, 15, 100 units and you want to get to that next level, whatever the next level is for you, there's a good chance you need capital. Maybe you need capital for a bigger office. Maybe you need to hire some additional folks. Uh, on your staff. Maybe you need some additional infrastructure. Maybe you need to upgrade POS systems in your units. What, whatever the case is, it, it becomes clear when you get to that adolescent stage that a capital infusion is very, very important to grow your business. And there are mistakes that are made in that stage as well as in the first stage. But in that adolescent stage, one of the biggest mistakes that happen is that the franchisor because they can't raise capital, or because they accepted, in the early days, the wrong franchisees because they needed that franchise fee check to keep the lights on. Now they run into this wall where the private equity people who might normally want to be involved, they look at it and they use the term, it's a hairy deal. You know, we've got franchisees with all sorts of, you know, royalty deferrals and just all sorts of deals which we'll talk about. So that, ad that adolescent stage is very, very key because what happens to a lot of franchisors is they either forge ahead without the money and most of them collapse or they go backwards and they start to trim down their growth and then they just stay at one level almost forever. So the adolescent stage busting through that ceiling and of course the third piece is exit and creating liquidity. Um, you build this big beautiful franchise company and you've got 500 units or 100 units or 60 or 6,000, whatever it is, and it's time to retire, it's time to move on, it's time to do something else. And a guy like Grant comes knocking on the door or one of his associates and they want to purchase the entire company. Now, and Grant will speak on it in great detail, and so will Roger. A lot of these purchases are based on a multiplier of your EBITDA line. That's the obvious. But then the behind the scenes is what's going on in that company. Have you as the franchisor, uh, do you have all the collateral lease assignments if you're a bricks and mortar company for your franchisees? Have you been collecting P&Ls for your franchisees, or have you decided, well, we're not going to chase them for the P&Ls because we don't want to rock the boat, they pay their royalties. And then what happens is a private equity firm comes in and they look at it and they go, well, you know, if your books and records were in order, you know, maybe this is a 12-time multiplier, but there's a lot of things here that we really can't quantify, so maybe it's really an 8-time multiplier. And, you know, that could be a couple of million dollars. So again, the setup for the exit is very important. If you're a startup or an emerging brand, think about it now. Don't wait five years. The equity markets are very hot, as Robert alluded to. Um, they're just, I mean, there are, there are private equity firms, venture capitalists. They have discovered franchising, I would say, I'm going I'm to say like 10 years ago, maybe a dozen years ago, it really started. You guys probably know better than I, but I started hearing about it about 10, 12 years ago, uh, and, and the, uh, the investments 
have gotten so robust that now private equity firms, in addition to investing in franchisors, they're actually investing in large franchisees. Franchisees that own, you know, 100 Panera Breads and 300 Wendy's. And so the markets are really hot, so it's a good time. As long as you're set up properly and you've got a compelling story and you've got compelling numbers and, and everything is in order. Proper positioning for your company uh, from the start will give you more options when you decide to either exit or create more uh, capital infusion. When the private equity folks show up, or venture capitalists, or an investor in general, okay, this can be at any stage in your development, but certainly in the private equity stage, you are under the microscope. So you need to have a very compelling story. You should have a written business plan. I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, I meet franchisors all the time that don't have a written business plan or a strategic development plan or even a mission statement for that fact. I mean, these are things that, you know, you really sometimes, the enthusiasm to launch the business, you go, well, I'll get to that. And the fact is, you never get to it or you're lost without it when you're already on the road driving and you haven't set the GPS, and that's how you should think of your business plan. <laughs> Documenting milestones, you know, there are successes all along the way. Uh, one of the things that I teach the salespeople that I manage is to win small battles along the way, because A, they're motivating, and B, they become milestones, and when you add them all up, you know, they, you win the game. So document your milestones. If in your business plan you, you say that you're going to award three franchises in the first year and open two in the first 18 months, and you either do that or you beat that number, make sure that's part of your selling proposition to the private equity firm. Because it means not only is your concept viable, but your management team knows how to get it done. And management teams are very, very important in the scheme of things. A lot of startup franchisors can't go out and, and buy a, a chief development officer for $200,000 a year and a director of operations for $150,000 a year is just not feasible. So there are companies like mine and other companies where you can actually outsource some of that and you can start to build your team that way and although those folks are not necessarily employees, but if they have track record with your company, you can also use them to leverage uh, your proposition to a, to a private equity firm. So very often, to get that first deal, well, we'll give this guy a discount on the royalty, which by the way, on the first deal, it is perfectly justified. You can justify that. You say, well, he was the first one, he took the chance. It's when you constantly are finding reasons to give that potential franchisee a deal. We're gonna give them a deal on the royalties, we're gonna give them a deal on uh, the, on this or that or, or whatever, then all of a sudden, your standard franchise agreement is no longer a standard franchise agreement. So that when a private equity person comes in and looks at it and they're going, there's 400 franchisees and there's 365 different deals out there. They don't know what they're buying at that point. So if you do negotiate your franchise agreements, keep it to an absolute minimum and in the beginning or as a justifiable negotiation point. So if someone's buying multiple units, your FPD probably already has a discount in there for multiple units. Perfectly justified. <laughs> Early mistakes can limit otherwise interested <coughs> investors and buyers. Um, Years ago, I launched a company here in New York with the founders, it was called Ranch One, the grilled chicken concept. And we had hundreds of franchisees, we opened up lots of units, uh, but in the early days, again, a lot of wheeling and dealing, we had franchisees that we didn't get um, conditional collateral lease assignments from their landlords, so if they decided to dump out of the location, we didn't have any control over it, which was a problem for us. So it, when we went out, raise money, we had a lot of people tell us, hey, you know, this is really a problem, that's a problem, and we, we, our pool of potential buyers was very limited as a result of those mistakes. And obviously can lower the valuation. I mean, and that's, that's really the key, because that's the first step when you're dealing with a private <coughs> equity firm or, or any investor is 
hey, we're going to sell this percentage of the company and we want X dollars for it. Well, when you do the math, that means you say your company is worth this. Many of you watch Shark Tank, you see, you know, a lot of those folks think their companies are worth $5 million and they're worth $500,000. So valuation becomes key because that's what the private equity firm is going to start to look at and negotiate on and that's what they're going to run their due diligence on to match up against. What is the valuation of the company? So just a quick recap. Written and compelling business plan, maintain defensible financial statements. I have people make financial statements to me all the time and they're indefensible. <laughs> they, just, they, they have no documentation, no background, it's all storytelling. And if it's not storytelling about the past, then it's fortune telling about the future. Okay, so story storytelling about the past that's not documented or or, or fortune telling about the future just doesn't fly in the world of the equity markets because typically, even though they may be buying potential, they're not going to pay for it up front. Okay, so, so do know that. Um, ensure clear and secure intellectual property structure. Can't tell you how many times I run into people that they don't, you know, they haven't structured their, their website in such a way where they actually own the domain or Facebook pages, or maybe they've got vari variations of their logo that they haven't trademarked, or just, that's your intellectual property. That is as important to you as if you own bricks and mortar corporate stores. So when you think about it, what is the value and the equity of the brand? A lot of it starts with the trademark and the intellectual property. So don't forget about that, it's a big, big piece and establish a strong management team and or an advisory board. It's always good when you can present yourself to an investor, either an early stage investor or a private <coughs> equity investor. And I tell, this, I, I, I tell this little line here, you know, a lot of folks think that the three most difficult words in the English language are, I love you. Those are the three most difficult words to say. Not true. The three most difficult words in the English language are, I don't know. Don't be afraid to say those words because very often you can surround yourself with advisors who do know and more importantly private equity today is not just the, the, the company writing the check they become strategic partners and when you look at firms you want to look at firms that are bringing more to the table than just money you want to look at firms that are going to bring some level of intellectual asset that you can use to help build your company. So don't be afraid to say, I don't know. For those of you who might raise some money, friends and family, but yeah, make sure you're not giving away the house, make sure you're not wheeling and dealing, guaranteeing that you're paying, you know, 50% of their investment back in five years and all of that stuff, because it's not gonna match up when the private equity guys send in their high powered due diligence CFO guy to come in and like rip the books apart. Okay? So be careful on that sort of stuff. And then I would say, start today. Don't wait until you have one unit, 10 units, or 50 units. Start that there. Um, just because Roger's into a lot of different things in the world of, uh, in the financial world. So, Roger, if you would, just from the general economy, um, in terms of, of where it is now, do you think that um, we're in a position where the economy help, helps or hurts startup businesses? Yeah, I've been in the financial world for 40 years, um, but my real claim to fame is I was an operator. I left Wall Street. I left Wall Street for the better part of four years, and I built uh, 15 arbitrage fish and chips shops in, in Canada. And um, I really enjoyed it um, until the last six months when I was really strung out. So with my MBA, with my Bachelor of Accounting and Engineering, and all my credentials, I was young and aggressive, and I, I figured out how to build stores without losing much money, and, and got 15 stores in the winter of 1979, only 40 years ago. And, 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 and I had post-dated checks all over the place, because I, you, know, you can pay almost anything with a check and get dated three months later. You know? So winter, winter came, winter came and, and, and that was the winter, 79, 80, when the interest rate at 18 percent under Jimmy Carter, and the North American economy turned down, and so, so, uh, in the fish and chips business, when Lent begins, um, your business pops 20 percent. 
that this course can't be beat. So, so, well, so business was slow, and I had these checks out there. And so every day, every day, I walk across the street to the bank and, and, and with the banker, based on my receipts from the previous day, decide which checks we could allow to clear. And then I have to go back to my office and make calls to four or five or six guys and say, hey, Joe, remember that check I wrote you two months ago? Well, you know, it rained this weekend and whatever, you know, and, and, and don't, don't bear with me, I'm going to get another check. I did that for six months, and of course the banker, he knew I was in trouble, of course, and, and my landlord knew I was in trouble, I was late with the rents, and so, so, I, so the banker wanted a present, he wanted me a, a presentation, uh, he wanted me, what am I going to do to turn the business around? And so I, this was before Excel, spreadsheets, you know? so when I was good with, with numbers, and so I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to cut costs, and I'm going to advertise a little, you know, carefully, and, and, and so forth, and, and he said, but what if it doesn't turn around? So what if it doesn't work? I said, well, look, it's going to work. I can't tell you to what extent it's going to work, but it'll work. And and, and we'll get to have some improvement. So what if it doesn't work? And I took my, my key ring out of my pocket, and you know, with the 15 keys, I, I, if it doesn't work, you own it. <laughs> no, don't do that. You know? The banker, he didn't want the stores. You know, He didn't want the stores. And, and so I ran it for those six months. And it's a long story how I extricated myself. I left all my money in Canada and came back to New York to start over on Wall Street. And and so um, so I learned firsthand that leverage matters. You can't do it. You can you can figure out a way to finance that, that store as, as a as, as an operator, as a franchisee, but you still have to pay the overhead. And and I use that experience, you know, you the old expression, you don't know pleasure until you've known pain. And so I had to start over uh, financially. Um, but I, I did in this, and that, all that knowledge served me very well. The general economy, it's much more important than it used to be. You know, the years ago, before the world was so interconnected, you could run your business, whether it was a clothing business or a food business or a tire business. You know, you didn't have to worry about what was happening in China or Europe or, or, or Venezuela. Right? But these days, we've got an inter interconnected world, and, and the value of the yuan matters. Uh, and you know, interest rates in, in, in Venezuela matter because they can affect this in our economy, and that can affect interest rates here and consumer spending here. And so you have to pay more attention to it. However, at the stage most of you are functioning, um, if you run your business really intensively uh, and execute very well at the store level, it, it's not going to be too much of a problem for you. Um, uh, until you get to the larger world, where you're talking to the private equity guys, and and, and then, you, then you know multiples matter, multiples of EBITDA, multiples of earnings, and balance sheets matter, and so forth and so on. But but your, your first, you know, your your job one is to make sure you've got a a, a a successful basic operation as an operator. You, I mean, you, you you don't need a lot of, of stores. Uh, uh, managed by yourself to go out and franchise. We need one, I'd say, right? I mean, you can't just dream it up and start to franchise it. Because you've got a successful store or five, doesn't mean you need to be worldwide. You make a living, you know, run a good, clean business, employ the family, cash is king, you don't have to get, you know, so I met a guy years ago, he was a, he, he, he opened a pizza shop in a lower level of a office building on the east side of New York, you know, and, and he was serving pretty good pizza, he was making a living, and he found me and he wanted to expand. He, he had one shop in the lower level of an office building, he thought he was going to be Pizza Hut someday, you know? I said, maybe if, before you start franchising, you know, should maybe try to find a location on the west side of New York, you know, and run two, before you run 2,000, right? For most of you in this room, stand, forget it. I mean, run a good business. Now, alone will get, but get your education, whether it be through Gary or through me or your reading or your books or whatever you want to do. Um, um, you know, learn what you can about your options as you build a business, because you know you may want to. Running a public company or a big, larger, privately held company, it's a whole different game. I mean, you're answering to people. You've got to count every penny. You've got to pay yourself less. You've got to. You know, account for all your expenses. You can't charge vacations to the business. You got, you know, you got board directors. You got audit committees. You got compensation <coughs> committees. You got. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a different deal. It's a different deal, and it's not for everybody. 
you got to block and tackle every day, build a profitable business, have fun, serve a good product, you know, and, and the rest will take care of us over time. I feel like definitely proof of concept. Work out your basic block and tackle. You get two or three stores, whatever your business is, get those working well. But then, then why not? If you're, a, if you're a mountain climber, if you want to do, you know, go from a million to 10 million, 10 million to 100 million, evaluate it. Because there, there's capital is available. If you're the really guy to do it, do it. Guy or guy to do it. Then, um, you know, go for it. If you're, if you're happy owning your job with a couple stores, your life is good, then you're, you're, in my mind, you're not a mountain climber. Be happy. If you want to take on the world and whatever it is, uh, regional or national growth, um, there, there's money available, but, but you got to have the, the, you know, the, the ROI, the management team, you got to be on top of your numbers, and that, that discipline, that being able to plan and execute right within 12 months and within multiple years. You know, so, so do it, if you're that person to do it. Sure, so what does the, the money, the private equity in the room think about both sides of that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think, honestly, it's, um, it's somewhere in between. I think uh, you don't want to get ahead of your skis too much. You want to plan for it from Gary's first point. Uh, we certainly focus on unit economics and making sure that you know, there's a, a really good economic return uh, for franchisees in any system. Uh, and any private equity firm will reiterate back to you all the same thing, which is we don't like cyclical businesses, right? Companies that don't perform or perform particularly poorly in economic cycles, which is why all of us run towards franchising, right? It is a, in theory, a recurring business. There's royalties that come through, you know, from your franchisee partners. Uh, if you're in, whether you're in auto or you're in home services or you're in restaurant, uh, for the most part as a franchisor, you're going to have a stable base of earnings in EBITDA that we're in the leveraged buyout industry that we can leverage against and we can uh, grow through, regardless of economic cycle. So uh, that's why, you know, 12 years ago, someone, whether it was my old firm discovering the Dwyer Group and taking it public or uh, whatever other private equity firm, you know, discovered the franchise model, uh, today everyone is running to it. Literally everyone in the franchise, in the private equity, lower middle market, upper middle market, wherever. Everyone is trying to find opportunities to play in it, both at the franchise or branded level, as well as scaled multi-unit franchisees. Which is so, so for the franchisors in the room, why that statement is so important is that that is an entirely, I'll, I'll use the term new, because it's within the ten, 10 years or so, that's an entirely new area of revenue that franchisors can look at that didn't exist 10 or 12 years ago. It did, but not to the extent. 10 or 12 years ago, franchisors were concerned with building more units, building good units, having profitable franchisees, more royalty, more royalty, more royalty, and that's how they grew their revenue stream, and that's how they grew their bottom line, and how they grew their business. Today, with private equity so excited about franchising as a space, that's a whole new opportunity that's out there for you to grow your business with, to use private equity as I look at it as a tool to continue to plot your course and live out your vision of you know whatever it was that, that aha moment you had when you created when you created your concept. And I guess to that point, Robert, what you know what do you see? I mean what do you see as the equity markets are obviously excited about franchising. What do you, what do you add? And, and also, kind of a, a bolt-on question to that is, what dangers do you see right now with respect to what's going on in government regulation, deregulation? If you can kind of just put that into focus for our folks here. Great. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I want to precede what I'm about to say by, by saying that this is not a partisan, like Republican-Democrat kind of a commentary. Um, we are in increasingly choppy waters. We, uh, during the Obama administration, franchising uh, got the literally the goat horns put on it uh, in, in, in the Walmart uh, conversation that went on, uh, where um, the aggravation that came towards franchising was you do nothing but hire low-wage workers and you don't pay them enough money and you should be paying, look, there's this wonderful brand that's attached to the back of this and, you know, these people should be getting $15 an hour and they should have guaranteed schedules 
and you know they, they should have health care and they should have vacations paid for by the frame you know and, and so uh, all of the chickens came home to roost for us that we have these wonderful big brands that are nationally many times internationally recognized right uh, but at the same time every one of your franchisees or most of your franchisees are increasingly uh, uh, you know, mom and pop, or pop, mom and pops very often when you're in a growing business like this. Um, so uh, you suddenly have foisted upon you the responsibility of IBM, but you're just George's chicken shack, and so you know uh, it, it is impossible to handle the demands. And so when they shoot at McDonald's or when they shoot at Yum, they often hit everybody here in the room, and and so. Uh, you know, uh, there's a there's this uh, the one thing that's so fascinating about franchising, and that uh, Gary knows as well or better than anyone even on the panel, is how many different facets it takes. So one chicken restaurant, you can get, line up every chicken concept next to one another, and you won't find very much uh, identical information between the the, the FDDs, the information that's disclosed, how the businesses are run. If they came up organically and, and not sort of driven through one process, you see a wide variety of stuff, which makes it so hard and painful and expensive to evaluate on behalf of private equity. Because if they work you know, as templated as you'd like to see it, well, then you just match up lines. But that doesn't that doesn't happen. And so uh, these things grew organically most of the time. And there are ways that the, 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 the outlines, the skeleton that you just built is, is exceptionally good for exactly that. So, um, government is suspicious of franchising. Uh, during the Obama administration, I sat with the Secretary of Labor's uh, wage officer who wrote a book, uh, Hostile to Franchising, uh, and I said to him, you, we should be best friends. And I said, we, we, we take people from the failed school systems who don't have a degree, from failed families, from economically distressed areas, and we take them off the welfare rolls many times or where they might end up on a welfare roll, and we give them a chance, like an on-ramp to the economic highway. They get to show uh, these foundation skills. They show up to work on time. They, they <coughs> treat customers respectfully. Uh, you know, these kinds of things, foundational skills that will help them develop a career either in franchising or outside of franchising. But that's not the, 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 the uh, there, there's a group of people, particularly progressive uh, politicians, that look through the telescope from the other end. and. All they see is uh, that someone is being abused, that there is labor that is being abused in, in a particular instance. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen anywhere in franchising, but it is not course and con uh, conduct, of course, of conduct for our businesses. Uh, you guys need, in your businesses, obviously, uh, employees would be great if you had some set of skills that you could, that, you, that the base skills from which you could work. Uh, and, then the, and then the other thing that I always say to politicians, too, is that challenge for a franchisor in particular is that you start off making the world's greatest pizza in the, in the you know in the uh, you know on the east end uh, in the bottom of a big building and uh, once you become a franchisor you just skipped out of your business the thing that you were good at doing that you proved yourself in doing you're now moving to a completely different business and so um, being successful and good at that requires a lot of information we have a lot of thank goodness there's a lot of information out there about this there are some great mentors in this business. Nina Dwyer Ellis, who has been referenced to the, uh, the Dwyer company here, has been a, a evangelist in this business, taking any number of different franchise systems under her wing and, and teaching them uh, you know, what they do and how they, how they do it. Dwyer is a standout organization, and it just I, I would say it's probably a record-setting price. Dwyer just sold at a very high multiple um, uh, and you see them inside here. They're under, I don't know if that's the new branding for them or not, but I think they're called Neighborly uh, when you walk inside. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 these private equity companies sometimes look here and say, you know, your peanut butter and my chocolate make a Reese's peanut butter cup that sells a lot better than just peanut, than peanut butter and a lot better than just chocolate. So, um, it, with the House of Representatives potentially changing hands to a Democratic uh, majority, uh, if that happens in the fall, uh, we're going to be up 
testifying a tremendous amount before the labor committees in the House, and maybe even in the Senate. If the Senate flips, the Republicans are basically at 50 at the moment. And so uh, if, that, if that flips, we're going to be doing a lot of testifying. That will bring a lot of heat down on this business model and a lot of questions on this business model. And uh, so uh, the president has been exceptionally um, open. Uh, he sees the value in, in, this, in this area. He sees the, the amount of employment that's here. And he sees the good that can be done by working cooperatively with us. I try to knock the froth off the road. I try to give a realistic uh, uh, representation of, of the challenges so, so I want to add something to, to what Robert just said to kind of bring it, maybe bring it home and closer to where startups and emerging brands are at. And then I know, Kirk, you wanted to add something to that, perhaps. But what I, what I want to say is that when Robert's talking about kind of this, you know, 30,000 foot view of the government looking at McDonald's corporate and maybe a franchisee didn't pay someone the right amount of money and now there's a lawsuit and there's all this bad press and on and on and on. Why is that, you know, how does that touch you as emerging brands or as startups? It touches you because you should be managing not only the expectations of your franchisees, <coughs> but you should be managing their performance to your FD. Now, why is that a problem for emerging brands? Because it means that perhaps you need some personnel. It means, well, I need someone to go out and visit franchisees and provide service in the form of not only inspecting the store, because franchisees, when I was a franchisee of Dunkin' Donuts, back when dinosaurs ruled the world, my partner hated when the Dunkin' Donuts guy showed up. I, I kind of liked it, but he hated it, because his relationship was that, oh, here comes the, cop, the Dunkin' Donut cop. Okay, so... As a, as a franchisor, you need to have someone in the field who's going to be a little bit of a cop, but maybe more of a parent, where maybe there needs to be a little bit of discipline, but a lot of love and a lot of encouragement. And startup franchisors typically can't afford that, so they let things slide. And what happens is a franchisee gets a labor audit, it hits the papers, your brand obviously is named, even though it's a franchisee somewhere down the road, your, your brand is named, and a guy like Grant comes along and goes, well, we don't really want any part of that until, until it settles down. Well, private equity is not going to be interested in um, um, if you have a complex uh, financial and, and, and legal structure in your business. It's too much to clean up. You, you know, you've got partners, they've got, to be, you've got to be able to roll them up into a clean vehicle. Nobody's going to talk about it. They don't get the, get the uh, structure attractively for to play in the larger pond, so to speak. Um, and um, um, so that, that was, you know, and, and one, one further, one for, I, I hate to be a continual, that, you know, what planted on, on private equity. Ah, go ahead, Roger. But, we're used to it. But, <laughs> but, uh, you know, how would you feel if you were a Tim Horton franchisee right now? You know, I don't know how much you read about that, but. You know, in over half of 3,000 stores in Canada, and, and over half the system is suing the parent because it was bought by restaurant brands, also in Burger King and, and Popeyes recently, and, 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 and so to, in, the, in their effort to cut costs, increase their profits, they cut the field staff down, they fired the, 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 the experienced field staff, hired younger people. They also raised prices on all the all the good goods that goods they were selling. The whole system is, is supply food and paper by by a distribution network and, and restaurant brands profits from that. So while the guys are serving coffee, three thousand stores are serving coffee in Canada, trying to compete with Starbucks and and, and the Dunkin' Donuts and whatever else is up is, is there. Um, the, the, the cost of goods went up twenty percent. So the restaurants, so that's so over, you know, over half the system is so, so therefore, you know, there, there's so many considerations that, you know, in terms of private equity being interested. I mean, if you're a franchisor, you've got to run a really clean, organized, profitable business. If you're a franchisee, you've got to be in the right system. There is a lot of money around. Low interest rates, there is a lot of money around, ready to invest in the right situations. But, but um, it, it obviously, it, You've got to get your education early and structured uh, efficiently uh, 
value? How do I increase the value of the company so that the valuation is higher, I give up less, and I get more money? Yes. That might be the million dollar question. Yeah, so this really speaks to the valuation, right? And, and uh, if anybody thinks the valuations are, are black and white, like science, I mean, it, go through a few and you realize how much it, it's, it's art, right? There's a, lot, there's a lot to negotiate. So from a franchisor or even a franchisee standpoint, you know, what, what do you need to be able to defend your valuation? And it, there's, a couple, there's a couple of main categories. Obviously, you know, increasing income, right? But if you can increase, you know, the, the finer point on that, if you can increase your income, in top percentile performance for your industry, now you're talking to somebody to get their attention. And if you can defend that it's top percentile, you have benchmark, it can change the conversation, right? Because it's just the fact that you're doing that kind of validates that a lot of the other things that you're doing your management team, your operations, your sales, validates that it's working you know, better than average, no doubt. And then the, the, the two of the other categories, one is one is you know, de-risking the business, right? If the business, if any business is dependent on you as the owner, you, 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 got, you got the owner's trap, right? If you step away or something happens, the business slows, then you know, it's, you, got, you got a concentration, you got a problem. Uh, things like what, make you, what makes you unique in the marketplace, right? That has a tremendous influence to what the ultimate value is of your business. Um, do you have recurring revenue, right? Because if it's recurring, like monthly subscriptions to cable or you know, software as a service, you got predictable earnings, right? I can look out two, three, four, five years and have confidence that we're going to make that kind of money. Um, so, so all those kinds of things, you know, employee dependence, customer concentration, recurring revenue, what makes you unique, owner dependence, right? There's literally eight drivers, not, not 18, there's eight like that, that if you very deliberately, once a month, make sure you're working on your business to develop th those aspects of it, then uh, when you go to raise money, you're, you're dependable. I mean, I, I can leave the business, at, at my business, I can leave for a month. And actually, when I step away, my business is doing better. Right? I don't know why that is. <laughs> and what's going on? Nothing, nothing slow. So, um, but being very deliberate about those kinds of things. Um, and then kind of, kind of the, the third, so de-risking the business, increasing profit to top percentile, and know it through benchmarks. And then habits, right? Habits like, uh, you know, be able to plan and execute. Are you looking at the financials every month? Like some of the, some of the things we're talking about here, um, you know, if you look at the numbers, the number story, are, are they are, are sales what you expected, better or worse, why, critical thinking, and what, what do we do as, as a team to, to either, you know, exploit an opportunity or mitigate something that, that's not going what you thought. Same thing with operations. If we expect some, some level of utilization or some level of return, if you, you, you can see what's moving the dial on your financials, then, then you can put it right back to the action as a, you know, before the year's over, as a leading indicator now, this month, we can still impact what we're doing by year end. So we, we build those disciplines, looking at the financials every month, using them, figuring out how do you create positive cash flow. I get paid prepaid in advance for my customer. That's better than being paid 120 days later, right? So um, benchmarks, doing your, your annual valuation. So what's going to be lit, what's going to be dragged. There's literally five habits of profitability that I'm kind of referring to now as we go through this discussion. Um, you, you, you do, you do that for your business, and then uh, it's, a, it's a whole different when you, want to, when you want to raise money, and you can show that you're, you're, you're effective, I, I can plan and execute within a, a 12 month and a multi-year time frame. When we use your money, this is what we're going to do with it, and you have an option to exit in five years, and you get whatever return on your investment that you need, then it's, um, it's, it's just a very different discussion versus uh, you know, not being sure what's going on and that kind of thing. So. And, and Grant, you know, you're, you're the buyer in the room, okay? So what, uh, just to shift gears a little bit here, what, what do you see right now in the franchising industry as kind of the, the hot spaces and then maybe the concepts within those spaces? What, what guys like you looking for? You know, something trades, a business that, you know, like a Dwyer sells, <laughs> and now everyone wants to get into home services. Um, and... But at its core, you know, we look for all of the things that um, Ken was just describing, which is, you know, predictability, scalability, you know, good business fundamentals, and infrastructure that can support growth. Um, and so, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter what category your business is in. I mean, if um, you know, if certain uh, pizza concepts are hot right now. 
they may not be in two or three years. And so, you know, uh, any financial investor uh, is not going to want to ride a trend. They're going to want to support good business fundamentals. Um, but sure, home services, auto, a few other categories okay, so are particularly that, hot right that's now. That's a good point. Yeah, you, Elder you care is a, is a you very talk good about a trend. Fitness and health and wellness. Trend fed. How, how, how do private equity investors determine Right. Kind of Otherwise, what's yeah. a trend? What's a fad? How does anyone you look at historical kind of performance over time? You know, there's there's very little that anyone can do to whether it's to predict macroeconomics or what's you know happening at a uh, uh, you know over a seven year horizon as a, a business category ramps up, whether that's going to fall or not. Um, but what we do focus on is is you know, is, it, is a business itself generally going to perform through those cycles? Um, and, and, you know, there's nobody has a crystal ball. Okay. So focus on what's sure. in the well, door. Rod, Rod has a crystal ball. Yeah. <laughs> I've got an important point to make. In terms, of, in terms of being attractive to a private equity, in terms of being a business that a private equity firm um, wants to live with, what's going to distinguish your commodity? I don't care whether it's chicken, tires, Apparel, fitness, what's going to differentiate your commodities, the culture you build. Greatest companies, whether it's Sam Walton built Walmart, he, was in, he, he, he never took vacation without visiting stores, whether it was you know, Howard Schultz. 27,000 stores around the world, they look you in the eye and remember your name. If you're a franchisee, you have to be affiliated with, if you want to find a company with that kind of, of, of a differentiated culture. And if you're a franchisee, you've got to look yourself in the eye and say, do I've got, have a guy? Do I really enjoy being in my stores? Do I walk in there and want to, want to greet the customers? Do I want to set the example for my employees? If you're if you're an operator, you walk into your store, you walk to the back room, you look at the numbers, and they're good or they're bad, and say, have a nice day. What are your guys going to be doing? They're going to be looking in the back room, looking at the numbers, massaging the numbers, right? But if you're if you're if you're an involved people person who walks into your stores and talks to the customers and buses a couple of tables or you know whatever it is. That's the example you're setting. You really like people, you know, and, and, and then your people you hire will do the same, you know, to follow them. So, so this, the bottom line is the culture is going to fill your business. The culture is going to bring in the private equity when it's ready, and the culture is to make you happy long term anyway. So, so that's, you know, think about that. And, and I want to add something to, to what Roger just said, because I can't emphasize that enough, and I emphasize that a lot especially when I onboard a client and talk about the <coughs> mission statement. Uh, earlier I talked about companies that don't have mission statements, writing a mission statement, writing a brand position, and then creating core values in your company. And there's several reasons, as Roger pointed out. One of those reasons is the tone you set as the franchisor is the tone your franchisees will set with their employees. So they, think about the guest experience in a retail establishment who is in front of your guests? It's typically that you know it could be it could be a minimum wage employee who's really not working for the money, so to speak. They're working because they need a little bit of money, but they may not make a career out of being the, the, the point of sale operator in a fast food place. So they want to have a great experience. They want to know they're they're treated with respect. They want to understand that if they need a day off because they want to go to the beach with their friends, that their boss is going to be flexible. So how your franchisee sets the tone in their environment really comes from the franchisor. So that's the first piece to culture. The second piece, I learned the hard way. I sold a company, and I'm going to say to the wrong private equity company. Now, what was wrong about it? Certainly not the money. By, by, to some people said they overpaid. Okay, so it wasn't about the money. But what I didn't realize was that the corporate culture of the private equity firm didn't match the corporate culture of the company that we had created. So when they came on board, there was this the clash of the titans, so to speak, and things didn't work out the way they should have worked out, not because the concept wasn't working, not because our numbers weren't in order, but simply because the culture of the private equity firm didn't match our culture. So, if you don't have, or if you haven't created some level of written corporate culture, 
do that because when you go to raise money, if you don't understand what that is, you won't know if the firm you're speaking with is a right fit. You have to think about that early on, not only from your franchisee's point of view, but from your exit point of view. I don't know if any of you want to add anything, but I just think culture is key. I mean, anecdotally, I'll, I'll say two things, and I, we keep harping back on the, the same uh, transaction, but Riverside, which I used to work for, so full disclosure, is a, a very good firm that invests in high quality franchise brands. Um, they actually have a mission statement and a, um, a set of core values that they live by, which is actually pretty rare in the private equity world. And it's not a coincidence that Tina Dwyer's business almost like mimics exactly what Riverside wants to do, which is create a best-in-class indoor, you know, service experience, etc. You know, have something tangible that they bring to their customers. Um, not every private equity firm has that. You know, I walked into a room once with a franchisor and. Um, he was talking about his vision for growth going forward, and uh, it was entirely predicated on uh, buying back underperforming franchisees. And we sat there and we were like, well, uh, why are you going to do that? How? Have you spoken to them about it? He said, no, no you know, I'll figure it out. I just need to you know, boost up my EBITDA so that I'm more attractive to you guys. And we sat there and we digested that very quickly. And we said, I don't think this is going to work. Um, there's a reason for that. And so it's, it is about mutual alignment and creating kind of the right culture. Well, what I would add as a, as a former franchisor is that it's not necessarily a one-time event. Your question of when do you sell your company makes it appear to be a one-time event. It's not necessarily a one-time event. Again, if you have a business plan, a written business plan, and you've done your projection models, and you see where your royalty streams and your revenue and what your costs are going to be, you might decide that you know, 36 months into the plan, you're going to go for a smaller tranche of money because you'll give up a lot less equity because your, your company might still have a lower valuation. And then that money stays in the company. Nobody takes the money off the table. Um, the money stays in the company, and that gets you to the next level where the valuation is now higher. And on your business plan now, maybe you go out for a bigger bite of the apple. So just to say when you sell the company, again, it, it's, it's a process. There's a series of steps that you want to take. Talk to a lot of private equity firms, large, medium, small. They do different things. Some look for 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 failing franchise systems, where they they have the expertise in house and they figure out, wow, we can really take this to the next level. We we know exactly how to fix this problem. They can identify it quickly enough. They can they can really boost it. Uh, so they're they're all literally all over the place. But uh, I'll tell you that every. The one thing I can say about everybody that I know of that's looking at international uh, opportunities is uh, they're looking for, most of the time, ethnic opportunities to bring back into the United States. So uh, a recent example is uh, with, a, with a food franchise that uh, is uh, very successful overseas and that comes from a home region that is very well known by that, uh, by that cultural ethnic group and they have identified 27 locations in the United States that have high concentrations of that ethnic group. And so they're, they're targeting them literally to go there, and the reason they're doing it is because that's where they start. That's where they can start. Uh, but then they want to grow it uh, to the next level. They want to Americanize it or bring it onto the, on the ground and get people interested in it as being something different and beginning to taste it. You know, to change the palate a little bit by, by having something interesting and that's not with our with our regular food staples and things like so that. So you see those of you who are startup franchisors, and I get another mistake I see very often is early stage franchisors, uh, they may be located in Boston. So they have two of their own corporate stores in Boston, and then instead of looking for pockets within that market that match the same demographic, to your point, on an international level, but on a local level, um, they'll hire a franchise broker, perhaps, who will sell one in Miami and one in Atlanta, and now they've shotgunned their growth, and a couple of things happen when you do that. It doesn't become an opportunity anymore. You don't know the market, you can't service the franchisee, and they have limited name recognition. So to Robert's point about an international company coming to the United States and finding those pockets of ethnic groups, is a very smart strategy, but it's the exact same strategy that you should employ 
as franchisors here in the United States to grow in concentric circles. Yeah, because listen, when you have to get on a plane and fly to Texas to visit one store versus getting in your car and driving one hour to visit a store, the franchisee in Texas isn't paying you more royalties. All you've done is increase the cost to service that franchisee. So keep that in mind as you as you grow your brands. No. Kind of capital grows like franchises in concentric circles. <laughs> the first circle is you. Okay, so how much skin do you have in the game, as they say? Beyond that might be friends and family. So when we when we were building out, we were growing a, a company that I was involved with called Desert Moon Fresh Mexican Grill. The founder of the company and his family had opened up one unit, and then like he went to his like relatives, they opened up two, and then what they found was there was some customers there that kind of really liked it, awesome. and they got involved. So the circle grew, and they grew more, and we grew it out until we actually went and got private equity money. But the the key there is is that if you if you if, if to launch your business costs a million bucks, and you've got 10 grand in, it's very hard to find something to put the rest of the money in because you don't really have any skin in the game. We have something called the, the Emerging Franchise Awards Conference at the annual convention yes. and it has doubled in size every year this uh, so far and next next year in Las Vegas. Uh, the Emerging Franchise Awards Conference, if you're in that space, if you're in between uh, zero and uh, 80 or so units, maybe up to 100, uh, then that's the conference for you. Two reasons. One is uh, you can get uh, uh, you can get mentoring from the IFA. We have people like Gary and others that that volunteer as mentors. Uh, and oftentimes you can get somebody in a in a business that's not exactly like yours. They, they might be in the flower business or they might be in the automotive business, but they know systemically how this works. So we have these buddy systems called a friendship. Uh, everything has a Fran in it. Uh, we have, it's called our friendship oh, program. Man. And, and, uh, yeah, we have no shame. Uh, and, but uh, but uh, so, so you can find these. You can find these programs out there. And there in the room, I think last year we had 200 people that were all emerging franchises. And my advice to you, before you go to speak to somebody who's in the private equity space or any of these other things, is really, really get your bearings for a little while and, and, and talk to some of the experts. There's lots of free advice out here. Learn from well, that. Don't point at me when you say free. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, well, this I got is, clients in the room who might give them the wrong idea. <laughs> educate yourself. Educate yourself. And before you approach somebody for money, know what they're listening for. You've heard exactly. some of that here today. Exactly. Yeah. Speak gonna, the language. I was going to say exactly. you got to educate yourself. I mean, you know, I read that as ski out of a book. <laughs> <laughs> You can learn a lot for free. You have to go sing, you have to listen, you have to see what he is interested in, what are the buzzwords, what are the equations, the calculations, and, you know, and, and then, you know, you'll be able here. You have to scout around, you know, pick up a little here, a little there, and then you and then you can just look at yourself and say, have I got it or I don't, you know. But if you don't, if you don't got it, you're not going to present it, and, you know. From a logistics point of view, you need to increase your passion and increase the number of people you talk to. So yeah. don't lose your passion, don't give up, just triple it and you'll get it. Just as the previous question, I was going to add that um, at the point that you need your business ready for raising money, whether it's for venture capital or PE, is it, it comes down to a lot, it's a lot of legwork. You know, CEO, CFO, I mean, literally talk to your phone of who are all the potential people you can talk to for VC money figure out which ones are interested in what you do and then working through the funnel to really where, where is there a match to work together and um, it, it's, it's, it's lay work. It's, it's, not, it's not a part-time job, it's full-time. The meetings are easier to get uh, than you might imagine. Don't burn those sources before you're well educated enough to uh, represent yourself and your ideas well. But as you're building your brand and growing uh, at a sort of from a from starting day one to you know you're now healthy and profitable and you've got a, a good density of stores um, there will be many people who will invest in your business and not take control um, many people who sit in the seats similar to what i said in, uh, we do need control and that the reason for that is because we need to be able to control our own destiny when we sell the business um, so we like to have you know the board control so that whether it's three years or five years or seven years down the line, if we've done what we hope to do, 
that we can um, then exit the, the business and generate a return for ourselves. So, so I have a follow-up question to that. So typically, if you're the founder of your company and you sell the majority of the company, where do you see the founder fitting into the equation, either on the board or as a visionary? Yeah, in your head? How did that work out? Say something about that earlier. So uh, our preference and many uh, equity sponsors' preference is to have a, a very active um, founder or entrepreneur um, who drives the culture of the business continuing on uh, in some capacity, whether you want to be the CEO and running it day to day, um, that's usually people's preference, um, or you want to elevate yourself over time and you know serve as a chairman of the board and you know focus on the areas that you like. Maybe that's real estate development. Maybe that's um, you know working hand in hand with franchisees. You know corporate development, whatever it may be. Um, there, again, to the original point of you know find the right fit. Don't jump at the first person who offers you money. There's a trillion dollars of capital that's waiting to invest in small businesses.